from the Clark Ford Studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MBW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon Podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in, but why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts, Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCrady. I deserve to be on TV. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Oxford Exxon Podcast. Chase Parm, Neil McCrady. Clark Ford Studio this morning. Obviously, a lot of baseball talk as Ole Miss ends its 2019 season, losing to Arkansas in Game 3 of the Fayetteville Super Regional. So we'll discuss the game, the weekend. Season end, probably the program today, as uh, the Rebels win Game 2 after losing Game 1, but can't complete the deal. The Hawks 14, the Rebels won, and the season ends. Ole Miss gets over 40 wins, advances as far as they have in the postseason since 2014. However, one, uh, one win, eight innings away from the uh, the College World Series, and we'll go through it uh, kind of step-by-step step today on the Oxford Exxon po- Podcast, brought to you every single day by the Oxford Exxon, the blue sky there on low, uh, Highway 6 West. You know about the daiquiris, 399, 44 ounces, uh, the two, the, the cheapest and the biggest, if you uh, have a desire for that, the mobile rewards program, the Speed Pass Plus out, plenty of ways to save money at the pump with the Oxford Exxon, and we're coming to you again from the Clark Ford Studio. We are Clark Ford's in Amory, Mississippi, 662-257-1900 is the number. Call the number, ask for Corey Clark. Tell Corey what new Ford you're looking for, and he'll send you a quote within 15 minutes in business hours. It's that simple. It's right to the bottom line. No hassle, no haggle like we tell you all the time. You get your quote, and uh, the rest is up to you. You can let it be a baseline for you moving forward, uh, or you can go ahead and let Corey and the people at Clark Ford uh, – Get you in a Ford product. You'll love it. You'll love the service after the sale. You'll love everything about uh, the way that they do business at Clark Ford. Corey wants to be your car guy. He wants to be your truck guy. He'll prove it to you. Just call the number and you'll find out. 662-257-1900. Tell him that you heard about Clark Ford on the podcast. You'll save $500 off your bottom line. I'll let you kind of lead me through it a little bit. I don't know if you want to go micro to macro, uh, vice versa, or kind of where you want to start, because it seemed like with this team, this weekend, this season, you kind of got comfortable with them doing one thing, and they uh, were inconsistent and went a different direction. So it's sort of all over the place right now from my, from my thoughts a little bit. All right, I'll go, I'll go big picture first, and then we can get into some of the individual stuff. You and I talked briefly yesterday during, I don't know, fifth, sixth inning of that game when – the outcome was obvious and you were trying to kind of figure out what to write. It, it's, it's hard to nitpick a 14 to one game, a 14 to one games, a blowout. It's hard to nitpick a blowout. So we'll get into that in a minute, but I'll start big picture on the surface, getting to a super regional on the road and losing to a top 10 team, a, a top 10 program, a program that was an, an out away from being national champions a year ago and is very much a national title contender this year. On the surface, that's not that devastating of a deal. Um, yet this was a group, Kessinger and Dillard and all of those guys, uh, including Ryan Rollison, who's doing really well in the minor leagues right now, that they were supposed to do something similar to what Arkansas has done over the past two years, and they didn't get it done. And now the, the clock has, has run out. The curtains have closed. Um, their careers are over. It's not going to happen. They're not getting to Omaha, this group. Not getting into the, the minutia of yesterday yet, because, again, that was one game and stuff happens and whatever. But now that it's done, big picture, where's this program? I wrote about it yesterday. Uh, there's a column on rebelgrove.com. I kind of went two stories, micro and macro. I wrote sort of what I thought um, was going on with the program, with that junior class, frankly, with Mike's legacy a little bit. And then there's also a story talking about uh, a couple things that we'll get to later that happened early in yesterday's game. But the program's solid. The program's above average. The program is from a consistency level, from a um, – standpoint of always competitive in the SEC West, it's a model program. There's no doubt they they do a lot of things well, and nobody would step in and go, oh my gosh, you better tear it down and start over, and everything has got to be rebuilt. That's true. But I used the word scar tissue yesterday, and it's not, this isn't about the fans. This isn't even really about the roster or anything. It's that this program, until they do one of two things, is going to feel weird. We're going to have these same discussions 
We're going to have the uh, the same talking points. We're going to have people on both sides of the aisle that, 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 that are in a stalemate at this point. And those two things are either they make the College World Series again, probably one more time, and, you know, whenever that is, it will chill. Or Mike Bianco is no longer the coach and they start over from a coaching staff standpoint. And until one of those two things happens, from the big picture standpoint, we're right here in the middle having this discussion about how big the monster is, how big the monster should be, and what the heck do you do about it. Because, you know, you, you look at this, I mean, and kind of saying big picture, you mentioned that junior class. Here's what they did do. They stabilized a program that, frankly, was was kind of sucking after 2014. You look at 2015, they went 0-2 in a regional. You look at 2016, they went 0-2 in a regional. You look at 2017, these kids' freshman year, they didn't make the postseason. They had zero postseason wins from the time they got off the bus from the College World Series until they beat St. Louis in the 2018 regional opener. Zero. Opener. Zero. So they stabilized things. They brought the program back up to the level that it had been. Um... They hosted regionals three out of the last four years, 16, 18, 19. Uh, that's commendable. That's a top 16 regular season program. That's what it is. Ole Miss is a top 15 regular season program. Now in the postseason, they're nowhere close to that. They're now one in five in super regionals. Um, they've been to two super regionals since 2009, um, obviously 14 in this year. And they've gotten to Omaha once. So that is the issue here is that, no matter what it looks like, when it falls between not enough to change staffs, not saying you should, I'm just saying that's where it falls between, not enough to change staffs and the College World Series, it's the same thing. We, we are in perpetual Groundhog Day with this program right now. Um, it's my opinion, mostly based from talking to you, but I've talked to some other people too, that had Ross Bjork stayed at Ole Miss, he's now the AD at Texas A&M or is about to be the AD. He at starts Texas. July 8th. Yeah. He's in transition. He's no longer the AD at Ole Miss. He can't make a decision. Um, Ole Miss had to win a regional for Mike to save his job. They did. If Ross Bjork were the AD today, in your opinion, would he even be contemplating making a change for change's sake, given the way this thing ended? No, I believe that um, the run in Hoover, while that did not change the problem, H had Ross Bjork made a change, it was going to happen because Mike, at the time, was 2-6 and six in the postseason since 14, with both those wins coming last year, and the fact that they had been one to one Super Regional since 2009. Uh, the run through Hoover, however, to get a host site would have made it more difficult, and then once they won the Regional, I think it would have been off the table. I, I don't think there would have been any sort of change with uh, with Ross still the AD should this have played out exactly like it played out. Um, I, I, it is my educated opinion, however, that a change would have happened had they lost the Regional. I think that was the, I think that was the key weekend. Once Ole Miss beat up on those teams and, and moved on and got to that next step again, I just th – th there's no way – I mean, it's not even really an opinion. It's just a fact. There's no way that you're going to fire a guy who was eight who was eight innings from Omaha. You're just not. Okay, so moving forward, and again, we'll come back. I know people want to pick apart yesterday's game, and, and, and we will to some degree, although I maintain picking apart a 14-to-1 game is somewhat just beating your head against a wall. Um, the big picture stuff is more interesting. So they go in the next season. They lose a lot. Looks like they're going to lose a whole lot. I think every drafted player on the current roster signs as of right now. Uh, I do too. Um, the biggest loss out of that group, in my opinion, is, is Houston Roth because Not I think he, he could have been their Friday starter. Uh, I, I think he's going to go pro. Um, I think you think he's going to go pro, and, and we're I, not talking. We're not talking to the same people, so that probably is I talked good. to Houston, and he did not say that, but that was just kind of what I intimated from the conversation. Okay, so they go in the next season, and on paper, it does not look like a a powerful group. It does not look like an elite team. It does not look like a team that is uh, is poised to do something on a big national stage. It's Mike Bianco's 20th season. 20th. That is a long time. It means two things. One, it means he's had sustained success. And two, it means that in all likelihood, and this is obvious, with a lot of people, it's getting stale. We don't know who the new AD is going to be. We don't know who the new chancellor is going to be. If next season is just an average season, obviously if it's a catastrophically bad season, it's an easy decision. If it's a phenomenal season, it's an easy decision. If it's just an average decision, 
does the pendulum swing towards change for change's sake? I do think when you get 20 years in, you know, because it, it, it's funny. Mike is in that really weird gap where he's had enough su- sustained su- success. He elevated a program that had been non-existent for 20 years, 25 years-ish when he was hired. Um, that he has a lot of capital built up. And they, because of the consistency that he shows, because frankly they're one of the top three most consistent regular season programs in the SEC, that g- it gains him tons of capital. However, he hasn't won enough to get like that Mike Martin level of security where, hey, he's been here 20 years and, hey, you can't fire the legend. You know what I mean? He's in that gap right there where there's enough ammunition where if you put me in a debate, you know, you know, competition today, I could argue either side. I'd feel comfortable arguing either side. I think I could do it effectively. So he's in that weird spot. And when you're in that weird spot – you do run the risk of them going, hey, it's just been a long freaking time. Congratulations, pat you on the back, let's see what happens. Now, in saying that, Ole Miss, I mean, and this is relevant. Now, they get $8 million back in um, to 2022, I guess. Ole Miss doesn't have a ton of money to throw around right now, just dispendable income. They don't. So, because of that... You look at this. I mean, I, I don't know this. I, I guess Keith could do something crazy. I expect them to roll Mike over. Well, okay. Mike is making $1.1 million this year, and he's going to get bonuses. And the way Mike's contract is written up, unless something has changed and I'm not aware of, is that whatever bonuses he gets in a season, that becomes his base the next season. So he will get a raise just because of the bonuses built in. And you're talking about um, when it, you know, getting hosting a regional and winning a regional. Those are going to be bonuses no matter what, and there might be some other bonuses too with – grades or drafted players that I'm not aware of. So Mike is north of $1.1 million next year. And if you roll him over, that's going to put four years on the contract, and that's going to put three years remaining from that point. Meaning, again, just like this year, if you fire Mike Bianco, you're paying, by the time you fire everybody and do everything else, it's about a $3 million deal. But you got to pay Mike about two one two two, and then you're going to have some other expenses too. So that's the thing as well. I think that... Because of the weird AD situation, because of Mike's success, because of him winning the regional, and because of you're not going to fire a guy that, again, was one game from the College World Series, I think it's potentially, potentially, I don't know this, potentially a two-year deal where, just from a financial standpoint, I just don't know what kind of sense it makes. Because Ole Miss is not going to fall off on season tickets. You know, this isn't a deal where we have the football conversation all the time of, hey, you know, if this thing goes 0-2, nobody's in the stands for Southeastern Louisiana, and then that New Mexico game, nobody's here, and maybe the Vanderbilt game, nobody here. So you start playing up the things of the people that would want change to go, hey, well, I mean, if it doesn't work, I mean, do, do, we, do you have to make a change to save money in the long run, even though it's going to cost a lot in buyouts because nobody's in the stands? That's not going to be the case for baseball. They're going to sell at least 6,500 season tickets next year, and they're going to be number two or number three in attendance nationally next year, depending on whatever Mississippi State has. Period. Bottom line. Lock. So from a fiscal standpoint, it becomes a very hard decision, and that's where I get the emotional thing. I get maybe what you should do, frankly. But I think it's more complicated than that, given the weird structure of Ole Miss, given what's going on with probation for football, the way the way money's been lost, and the way that, to the fans' credits, to the fans' credit, they show up every time. So from a monetary standpoint, it makes it a really hard call, in my opinion. Yeah, because it makes it a hard call, period. Is that fair? Yeah, it's more than fair. It's that deal where... I mean, again, if they go, you know, six and 24 in the league, it's an easy decision. But there's nothing, nothing in his 19 years. Mike has gone worse than 14 and 16 one time. Yeah, there's nothing to support that feeling that that's going to happen. And then obviously the other is true, which is we're 19 years in and the there's nothing to support the Omaha or bust uh, attitude either. You nailed it. And look, this is hard for a lot of people, and I get the frustration. I do. It's a top 15 program. It's just not a top 8 program. What's a a top 15 regular season program? Frankly, it's not a top 30 postseason program. No, but but the regular season is – it's how most people are – you can't get – 
in position to do anything in the postseason unless you do it in the regular season, and they do it. Well, no, look, both things are true. You you have to have a good regular season, and that the regular season is what sells tickets, frankly, because people go to the yard every weekend and have a great time. However, you're wasting those regular seasons when you never do anything in the postseason. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just talking about just in terms of the way you judge a body of work. The majority of it is the regular season. If all you ever do is have a, a postseason run or something, and then you go five bad seasons in a row before you do it again, that that's not consistency. Give Bianco credit and that program credit. It is consistently an NCAA tournament team, and that's what it is. They win some regionals. They lose some regionals. They've been to Omaha one time and. Assuming they don't make it next year, one time in 20 years. Now the program's not bottomed out. They haven't had the droughts like Auburn has had, like Alabama has had, like, frankly, Mississippi State has had. South Carolina's dealing with right now. Yeah, but they they rarely have the magical moments either. Yet, you look up last weekend, and they host a regional in Oxford, and the place is just packed. It's completely packed out. Um. All the businesses in town are overflowing. The people that own restaurants and bars and hotels and all of that, they benefit from it. And uh, the people show up and they pack left field and they pack right field and they pack the concourse and all of that stuff. It's hard to look at that just one week ago and go, oh, it's an unhealthy program. It's not. It's just a program that they, you know, and they saw it up close and personal yesterday that plays in the same division with uh, a handful of programs that frankly right now are ahead of them. And Mississippi state is absolutely ahead of Ole Miss. Arkansas is absolutely ahead of Ole Miss. Um, And then you, you battle LSU and you battle Texas A&M and you battle Auburn, which is going to the college world series for the first time. See, That's the frustration for Ole Miss is Ole Miss doesn't have that Auburn year where, frankly, you're not very good and you just get it done. Every other SEC team makes that happen. And I'm not not advocating for change. I'm just – I'm defending the fan that is pissed off. Yeah, and I think – Because they don't. They they, they, Ole Miss never wins the road regional. They never win that series that you're just, frankly, good enough to win and you don't. Yeah, well, and and this is – you know, I'm kind of working on 10 thoughts and it'll either run today or it'll run tomorrow. It's summer and, and to be honest, the next couple of weeks are screwy and and, and it just kind of is what it is. So it'll it'll be published when it's published. But one of the things that I kind of note in there is Mississippi State put themselves in position all season to get that super regional played in Starkville. They did. They did everything you needed to do to make sure that those penultimate games were played at home. Um, The same for Arkansas. They did everything all season to make sure that that game yesterday was played in Fayetteville. And it was packed, and it was loud, and people talk about the fans being whatever. Let me tell you, the fans intimidated the umpires a little bit. And that's part of having home home field. Um, Yet on the other hand, LSU had a home super regional, and they dropped dropped the ball. Um... Auburn had to go on the road and for a regional and a super regional and somehow won. It's a credit to Butch Thompson. Uh, his team played loose and they played, they had fun and, and all of that stuff. And yet that's always been the knock on Mike's teams. And I watched the games. Ole Miss didn't appear to be tight. I just think they got beat. Yeah. No, I, th- th- there was no, Oh my God moment this weekend. Yeah. I mean, so let's, let's, Let's go into the, the Super Regional. We haven't podcasted since it started. Friday, obviously. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll do that in they, one second. Kind of last thought, and we'll go to a break. We'll come back. Um, big picture-wise, kind of wrapping that up, is uh, Ole Miss, I don't even really know how to say this because I, I, I kind of got off sidetrack a second ago, but – Yes, you're exactly right. I completely understand it. But it's where this comes in. The travesty was not losing a three, two out of three to Arkansas. It was really hard to beat Arkansas two out of three twice in one season. Nobody else has done it. Arkansas was basically 0-2 against Ole Miss in series the last two years and 18-0 at home against everybody else in series. Uh, Ole Miss's reason we're having this conversation is because 
They did everything you're talking about last year and blew it. And I'm not getting back on the Tennessee Tech thing, but that was the season that was the real problem here. This was not, this in some ways, as we'll get to, was kind of a success story of a team that had no identity for a lot of the year, really scuffled. I think Thomas Dillard or Mike yesterday said, hey, we have some points. We had no idea even how to pick up a baseball, it seemed like. And they got to this point. This was not the problem. It was because of what happened last year when they did do everything in the regular season and blew that regional and then would have played te- you know, a Texas team that frankly wasn't very good and the Super Regional back in Oxford and all that. It's really a two-year conversation in my opinion because they've seen both sides of it. They've done what we're talking about and haven't gotten it done and then they went to the other side, had an opportunity and didn't get it done on that side either. Yeah. Last year was a an absolute blown opportunity, frankly, to play for a national title. Yeah. So. And and it's it's you don't get those chances back when they when they come and go. And credit to this team, they looked dead in the water three weeks ago, and uh, they weren't. But you know they did a lot of things in the regular season that put themselves in a position to have to do it on the road, and and they in many ways got a great draw because they got a really easy regional in Oxford. That's that's putting it real. They got a very easy regional and a very difficult super. Yeah, and they got put up against a team that is very good. And um, we'll get to that in a minute after we do pay some bills here. But, you know, credit to Arkansas, too. I mean, there was a lot of pressure on Arkansas yesterday. They, they had lost a Saturday game, I mean, a Sunday game, and they put themselves in a winner-take-all game, and everybody's showing the replay of that You know, if you look at it from an Arkansas fan standpoint, every time you turn the TV on, it's PTSD. They keep showing the the, The ball Carson Shaddy didn't catch. Yeah, they show the pop-up. The ball's in the air, and that ball is your national championship if you just catch it. And you don't. And to their credit yesterday, they they showed up and absolutely punched Ole Miss in the mouth. And and credit to them. They're going back to Omaha, and they've had a a season that that, uh, deserves to end in Omaha one way or the other. Podcast brought to you in part by Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga, one of the oldest mortgage companies in the southeast. And all underwriting and processing is done in Memphis, so you're getting local underwriting that understands your market, a leader in condo financing in Oxford, and the float-down option, so you can lock in the current rate. But if rates go down before you close, you get that lower rate, 662-234-2704, or J-L-O-W-E at communitymtg.com. Father's Day is coming up soon. It's uh, actually on Sunday. It's the uh, perfect time to break the monotony of boring Father's Day gifts with a pair of Mississippi-made Blue Delta jeans. Don't get Dad another tie. Get him a pair of jeans that you know he'll love. If you can't get him into the Oxford studio before Sunday, it's okay. Email info, I-N-F-O, at bluedeltajeans.com to purchase a gift card that Blue Delta can ship out to Dad for his big day. And uh, speaking of coming to Oxford, Ole Miss Orientation is in full swing this month. If you're coming to town for orientation, it's the perfect time to drop in the studio. Check out Blue Delta's raw denim and Holland and Sherry fabrics, as well as the new spring summer collection and their new tactical camo pants. Listen, guys, don't be the guys uh, wearing poorly fitting jeans at orientation. What you want is uh, you, you want to look sharp for your kid. You're making an impression also. So Blue Delta Jeans, info at BlueDeltaJeans.com to set up your private fitting. Guests will join us on the Patterson and Earhart Hotline. Patterson and Earhart Attorneys at Law. They specialize in personal injury law and real estate law. But theirs is a general practice that can handle any of your legal needs. When you contact Patterson and Earhart, you're going to speak to one of the partners in the firm. And that's who will handle your case, not some paralegal at a faceless corporate firm. If you think you have a uh, legal issue, uh, if you know you have a legal issue, but you're not sure whether it's worth pursuing, uh, take advantage of being a podcast listener. Get in touch with John Calvin Patterson. Get in touch with Wes Earhart and uh, let them know that you listen to the podcast and that you just want to get some quick uh, legal thoughts from them. That initial consultation is free. And then you can take it from there, 662-526-1992, or check out their website, pelaws.com. Again, that initial consultation is free. Uh, Like I said a minute ago, Father's Day is upon us. You know, it's that day when uh, you're appreciated with some underwear that belongs back in the 80s, some wacky, tacky ties and uncomfortable socks. You smile and you nod in appreciation. You look for a way to sneak away to watch your favorite sporting event of the day or sip on your favorite beverage. 
We know uh, socks aren't the sexiest of gifts, but why should you sacrifice style and comfort if you know the inevitable is coming? So tell your wife or your girlfriend, but not both, to log on to deadsoxy.com and order the Father's Day gift his feet will love. They've lowered their collegiate line down to seventeen fifty while supplies last. So go to deadsoxy.com, enter the code REBELGROVE at checkout for 30% off. And happy Father's Day from the people at Dead Soxy. And don't miss one minute of the action at the vault this season as Ole Miss football arrives this September. Reserve your season tickets with the new 2019 season ticket pricing for just $299. For more information, visit OleMissTix.com. That's OleMissTix.com. All right. So you want to go a little, uh, little more, a little smaller picture now? Yeah, let's go small picture. Okay, so Friday, Isaiah Campbell won. He was really good. Yeah, it really uh, would not have mattered. The, 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 the end of the day on Friday was that Campbell was awesome and Etheridge wasn't. Would yeah, been- uh, Saturday was the flip. Yeah. Doug McKenzie was very good. So was Houston Roth. Arkansas's pitchers were not very good. Ole Miss won. So you had a blowout, and you had a blowout. Yeah, re- re- real quick here. You know, we mentioned Roth is a big deal if he does leave, and I expect him to leave, as, as do you. Um, I do think he would have been the Friday night starter because I think – my opinion, I don't touch Doug Nikhazy if I have another viable option. He's so good on Saturday. He has the right mentality for those Saturday swing games, and you know the stuff is going to be elite. I try to go 8-2 and two on Saturday with Nikhazy next year and then figure out the other days. That's what I do. And I think Roth would have given you a really good option on Friday night because he only allowed – he did not allow a run in more than a month in relief outings since he got healthy, frankly. And overall, he only allowed a run one time – in his last 19.1 innings and uh, nine appearances over the course of the season. So he he really had gotten get going there toward the end. So I think he's a huge loss. I think that, you know, even even on Saturday, you know, Nikhazy hung in there. I thought Roth really made the game in the sixth inning. Ole Miss is up eight to five, I think, at that point. Arkansas had made a little run. They started trying to use a few more arms because they were in it and they could put it, put it away in, the, in game two. And Nobody had gotten out that that Arkansas top of the order with Ezel and Martin and Fletcher and uh, Goodhart the entire weekend. I think they were something like 9 for 18 on Friday. I think they were 7 for 11 uh, at that point. And Roth retired seven of the eight batters he faced at the top of the order the rest of the way, just completely shut them down. I thought had he not done that, even game two would have been in some, uh, in some semblance of peril. In some ways, Roth was maybe the MVP of the weekend. Yeah, and, and in many ways, I, I don't know. I, in, in some ways, I think it would have been easier for some Ole Miss people to swallow had Game Two gotten away, and it just would have ended there because they they set up a Game Three yesterday. Obviously, look again, fourteen to one. You you really there's there's not a whole lot you fourteen can to one, and no matter who you put in, they were not effective on the mound. But let me start here. Okay. I only uh, and I really only have two questions because again it was fourteen to one. At some point you have to credit the better team, um, and they they're really good and they're playing with a sense of purpose. And the kid that came in for them in relief, uh, Scroggins, I think was his name. He threw four point one scoreless. He was really good and and he was the MVP yesterday. Uh, he and and uh, uh, Kerstat who had not been hitting all that great, and then yesterday he he was on. Uh, so, so credit to Arkansas again. So, two questions. One, this team did the hey, we're wearing the same uniform every single game because it's working. And if you think that you're winning because of a uniform, you are. Why, before the biggest game of your season, do you change the lineup? I was fine, or I don't think I would have done it, but I understood changing the people, literally like adding new people to the order. They've had a left-handed lineup for most of the season. That's what they did. It's been cool. It worked. It was fine. That's whatever. I don't don't have a problem with that. Um, The only question I have a little bit here, and we don't know how he would have moved because Knox LaPosser got hit – by a pitch, they took him out because they changed pitchers. Arkansas took Wicklander out, and they, they flipped their lineup around and put a bunch of left-handers in because Arkansas is all right-handed in the bullpen except for Matt Cronin. Uh, but he's still on crutches. Now, he could play. He had a hit in the regional. He's been okay. 
but his mobility has to be somewhat compromised if he's still precautionarily on crutches another time. So I wondered about that a little bit. And the wind was blowing out like crazy to right field. It was the hardest the wind had blown all weekend. Bomb was a launching pad. It was easy to get balls out of there. Normal fly balls were being caught at the track. I would have played the wind more than I played lefty-righty yesterday. I would have just started Kevin Graham and hoped he run into one at some point. Um, so all those things, either way, I get it. But what you're referring to, Ryan Olenek had frankly been bad in the series. He had one hit later in the game yesterday. I think he finished one for 12 or something like that on the weekend. And Mike bumped Olenek up to second, moved Kessinger to third, um, moved Keenan down to sixth yesterday. And he's done the thing with Keenan a little bit, but I don't do anything to get rid of Gray Kessinger from that two-hole. The two-hole, statistically, is the most important spot in the lineup for your best hitter. And, yeah, I get that in, in a one-game sample size, it's, it's, it's luck where guys come up. However, really early in that game yesterday, Olenek comes up with two men in scoring position, two outs. It was in the second inning. It was right after they had taken – or it was during the at-bat where they took Wicklander out of the game, which we'll get to in a minute – and put Scroggins in, and Olenek strikes out, the, the inning ends, and Ole Miss is up one nothing instead of 3 nothing. I would rather have had the guy that led the SEC in hitting taking those hacks at that point. So I thought that it wasn't a very good decision, and it was sort of an unlucky deal where it was magnified because of how the game early on played out. But, but the biggest problem for me yesterday, beyond all the other things from a lineup standpoint, was moving Gray out of that two-hole. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it. Um, he's been great in the two hole. He's comfortable in the two hole, and in some ways, um, it it shows a lack of analytics because the two hole is more important than the three hole. Yeah, it it very one traditional of, baseball to put your best guy in the three. And, I, always, and I'm not a big sabermetrics guy, but it still is what it is. Um. Yeah, and I am kind of a sabermetrics guy. I think it works. That that being said, I'm also a cliche guy. Cliches are stick around for a reason, and there's a cliche that that sticks around for a long time, and it's if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. And it wasn't broke. <laughs> they had literally 24 hours earlier scored 13 knocked, runs, knocked Arkansas all over the park, and sent Arkansas to the brink of elimination. And had Arkansas thinking, I mean, look, Dave Van Horn, and we'll get to this this part of it because it all sort of intertwines. All you have to know about Arkansas's mental state going into game three was down one to nothing, I think, in the second inning. It was the second inning. Ole Miss had a couple of men on, two outs, and a 2-0 count to somebody. I can't remember. It was Olenek. That's the bat I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. A 2-0 count to Olenek, and Dave Van Horn goes, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to my bullpen. There's a chance that this is going to backfire on me later if this thing ends up being a slugfest. If this thing's 14-11 to 11 or something, I probably am going to my bullpen too early, but I can't do this right now because I fear if we fall behind 3, 4, 5 to nothing that mentally we're screwed. Well, that's exactly what happened now. So he goes and gets Scroggins, and to Scroggins' credit again, dude makes pitches, he gets out of it, and the rest is history. But that's all you have to know about Arkansas, is that they were they were ready to they were ready to be had. Arkansas mentally was scared of Ole Miss. Ole Miss had won four series in a row in the series. They had shown that they could win in Fayetteville. They had battered them the day before. And I get this is the team. I get this is fans, and this doesn't relay. But I wrote this on the board yesterday. I went down to the lobby and just kind of had breakfast, and I wrote a Hoglin, uh, Hoglin uh, Wicklander story while I was sitting there. And a lot of Arkansas fans coming through fairly panicked, go nervous, not really even kind of wanting to go to the park, going, ah, yesterday was the day we had to have. It's whatever. That park, while Bomb did end up getting loud once Arkansas got going, it was really ripe early in that game for a quiet, weird environment with everybody kind of panicking. Cooper Johnson, huge base hit to put them up one nothing, And it, it, it's where, yeah, it's 14-1, and we got to be careful with minutia. But 3 nothing right there, I think, changes at least the complexity of the game on how people press a little, on what the crowd does, and frankly, gives Ole Miss a little more energy to add on because... 
once it got to about five one six one seven one whatever it was, I'm not. I mean, look, your your mentality changes, and you do not have the energy that you did early in the game. It just is human nature. It is what it is. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, and one team, one team smells absolute blood, and they're playing loose because they know they're winning the game, and the other team is, God, we have to finish this, don't we? We we've got to get through this, and the crowd's yelling at you, and. You're thinking about, hey, it's the end. This is over. I mean, I, it, it's a complete – you can see the body language. You don't have to be a damn genius to figure that out. The game was decided early. So here's question two. You talked about it. The analytics are there, and the analytics in this case are so obvious that it begs the question, why did Mike Bianco let – Gunnar Hoglund see that line the second time. Yeah, so Hoglund the last time that he uh that he or the two times ago that he pitched, he did a really good job against Arkansas. He gave up a couple iron runs and six point one innings and he was good. However, and this is credit to Nick Suss of the Clarion Ledger, he did these stats. I did not, but he gave them to me and I believe him because he's a baseball nerd in a good way. Um Gunnar Hoglund this season, not against Arkansas, I mean all the starts of this season. Um in the first time through the order. So we're talking first two, three innings, whatever. He has a 1.59 ERA and a 225 batting average against. He's excellent. We noticed there was a weird contrast early in the year, and there was the, there was talk about, oh, is it wind up versus stretch? What is it? Is that different? No, it's simply players seeing him a second time as a freshman that's got some things he's got to fix. So the second time this season that a lineup sees him, a 9.28 ERA and a 6.25 batting average against. I mean, oh my God. And that's coupled with what I just mentioned a minute ago with Ezel and Martin and Fletcher and Goodhart and even Kerstad, even though he wasn't hitting until yesterday. I mean, that is a really formidable one through four, one through five. And if you go get him, and I get his hindsight a little bit, but it's really not when the stats showed this. Ole Miss is up one nothing going into the second inning. And in the first inning, Gun- Ho- 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 Hoagland got hit. Gunner got popped around a little bit, but it was three up, three down. Two balls were caught at the warning trap. So they get to the second inning, and Nesbitt has probably the at-bat of the game, if you really want to talk about it. At the time, Ole Miss was 1-1, and Nesbitt goes down and gets a slider that Cooper Johnson tried to block. He actually went down to it, tried to smother it, block it. And Nesbitt went down, got it, hit it into the corner, gave Arkansas a 2-1 lead. Hoagland comes back, strikes out Christian Franklin, the, the, the Arkansas nine-hole hitter, and there's two outs in the inning, a couple guys on, second and third. So, Ezel's coming back up. You know these stats. You know that Austin Miller's ready in the bullpen. And you know that Ezel has been white hot throughout the entire weekend. He pitches to him. Ezel gets another hit. It goes 4-1. And at that point, everything changed. I'm not saying that Arkansas wouldn't have won the game because, again, Miller wasn't very good. Caracy wasn't very good. But you can look at the early innings when it was still a game and go, if you just go to the bullpen there and you get out of thing, that thing at 2-1 and Hoagland doesn't see the lineup because Mike even brought him back out in the third inning and he gave up two more base runners to that part of the lineup before they took him out, and at that point, it was just ripe for a for a, for a massacre, and that's what happened. Mike yeah. uh, was asked about it in post game yesterday. He said that, uh, frankly, he just didn't think he had enough pitching to pitch nine innings unless Hoagland could give him a little bit of length. Um, debate it, agree with it, disagree with it. He was asked, and that was his answer. Again, you he can't got, you can't he, make somebody uh, give you the answer you want. That's what he said. Mike got bailed out by the fact that Miller was not good yesterday. Yeah, had Miller been really shut down and they just lose that game six to five or something, it would have been really, really hard to get over that one. Yeah, he got he got bailed out by the fact that Miller was not good. Uh, Karachi was not good. Frankly, Karachi was worse than Miller. Um, and then Phillips pitched mop up, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it does it, it. It really makes you wonder, like, what what are you thinking? Because I'm I knew those stats before it. I guess I'd seen Nick. Or so I can't remember. I knew the second time through he was not good. And I thought, why are you letting him go here? Get out of the inning. Get to 2-1. Because you can't play. It's that deal of you can't play for the eighth and ninth inning in the second or third inning. Because if you lose it in the second or third inning, the eighth and ninth innings aren't going to matter. And that was the thing that to me was most interesting is that here's the ball game. Right now, and you got to you, you got to stay in the game right now. You got to figure out the end when you get to it. 
That's what Van Horn said yesterday. At one point, he goes, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an eighth inning when we thought about using Cronin. If that game's close in the fifth, they would have gone to Cronin. Wherever. I got to get yeah. out of this inning. They were going to do what LSU did in game two with uh, Fontenot. Was it Fontenot. Where, you know, hey, look, I, I realize that by pitching him 90 pitches today, he's not going to be available tomorrow. Skip Bertman says hello. Says, well, yeah, maybe. Um <laughs> He's not going to be available tomorrow, but if you don't get to tomorrow, what difference does it make? Yeah. And so, I don't know. That's that's. I don't watch them enough to be able to have a truly educated opinion. But in that moment, I'm riding my Peloton, watching the game, and I said, "You got to make a move here. You got to make a move here." And you couldn't bring him back out for the third. No, he was done. Um, he was done. You. you you had to go elsewhere, but again, it it feels like a silly con. It, it it is some it, it is a valid conversation. You just have to make sure. And you and I talked about this yesterday. That in the very next sentence, you say, "Now it's important to note that Miller was not effective." Yeah, and right. they hit they hit him very hard, and Karachi was not effective. They hit him very hard, and there's a real decent chance that it wasn't going to matter. That nothing was going to work yesterday. That it was just their day. It was their park. Uh, daytime. They like daytime games. Wind was blowing out. The weather was nice. All of those things. And they smelled blood. And they were not going to be denied. I mean, I do think you have to include that in the next breath. Otherwise, it just it, it feels in, insignificant. But, you know, if, if you bring in Miller there and he gets out of it and it's 2-1, to one, well, that's a completely different game than 6-1. to one. One. Yeah. Seven to one, eight to one, where you're like, okay, well, we, we blew it, yeah. And so, you know, that's that's the deal, frankly. It, well, and I mean, kind of the last thing on this point, Ole Miss didn't even do what Arkansas did the you know day before to fight back and sort of make it a game again. You know what I mean? Where Arkansas oh, yeah. did it to their credit, at least got it back to eight five. Ole Miss didn't score again the rest of the game. Um, if Arkansas lays down on Sunday, Roth is available. Yeah, completely changes the series. But they they fought back and they made it eight to five. And at one point, like we talked about earlier, they had the tying run at the plate, and uh, Roth got out of it. But they, Ole Miss had to use Roth, and yeah, then um, you know, and then Ole Miss, uh, you know, built on the lead and, and got it done. So credit to them. Look, the the best team over the weekend won the series. Yeah, the bet the 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 team that won the series is the one that was better two out of the three games. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's uh, why you put three games. Yeah. Podcast brought to you in part by Master Cuts Lawn and Landscape, premium lawn care throughout northern Mississippi, but a lot more as well. They build, some, build custom playgrounds, retaining walls, pool decks, outdoor living spaces, paver patios, forestry mulching, and much more. The path to your dream backyard easier than you think. Go MasterCuts.com or 662-607-7773. The uh, podcast also brought to you by Pinnacle Trust. Pinnacle Trust based in Madison, Mississippi. They represent clients in more than 20 states, have advisors in three states. They were founded in 1997, and what they do, and they've been doing it for a long time, is they provide detailed, specialized investment management, financial planning, retirement planning for individuals and businesses, and much, much more. They treat investing like a commodity. Decisions are made using objective information and research, not emotions. So regardless of your level of wealth, Pinnacle Trust will sit down with you, listen to your goals, study your expenses, and put forth a comprehensive, detailed financial and retirement plan that is built just for you. It's Pinnacle Trust, Pinnacle Trust, uh, pintrust.com, P-I-N-N trust.com. Mention that you heard about Pinnacle Trust on this podcast, and you'll get 10% off your first year's fee. I'm taking questions for my mailbag, which will run later this week on rebelgrove.com. It normally runs on Wednesday. It probably will not run on Wednesday this week, but it's okay. It's uh, summertime, and everybody's schedule, including mine, is crazy. Uh, speaking of crazy schedules, if yours is taking you through Jackson, whether it's for business, whether it's for a wedding, for pleasure, whatever the case may be, uh, you owe it to yourself to stop by the West in Jackson. It's an absolutely fantastic hotel. It's home to Soul Spa, the ultimate luxury spa experience in downtown Jackson. It is also home to Estelle Wine Bar and Bistro, where you can sip on a creative craft cocktail or enjoy their curated wine list. List. It's open for uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch, and uh, you will not regret stopping in and enjoying the many offerings uh, made by Chef Caden. So that's at 
uh, the Weston Jackson in uh, downtown Jackson. Podcast also brought to you by John Edwards, Regency Travel Incorporated in Memphis. Uh, whether you're thinking about that golf trip or an anniversary trip, a uh, cruise, whatever the case may be, get in touch with John. He's a part of Virtuoso. It's a worldwide network of travel partners that allows John to supply his clients with added values and unique benefits that are simply not available to other travelers. John traveled the globe for 37 years before getting into the travel business. He knows the extra attention that's needed to make a special trip, one that creates a lifetime of unique memories. So give him a call, give him some parameters, give him a budget, and then let him give you options that you won't find on your own. And know this, you don't have to live in or near Memphis to take advantage of his services. It's 901 904-3387 494-3387 or send him an email jedwards at regencytravel.net first time clients can save $50 off their first booked trip just by telling John you heard about Regency Travel on the podcast it's a podcast that's also brought to you by Grenada Nissan if you're in the market for a Nissan vehicle Grenada Nissan's the place to go they've got a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles go in, uh, test drive one today and uh, tell John that you heard about Grenada Nissan on, on the podcast and or at rebelgrove.com and you'll get Rebel Savings on top of the already great deals at Grenada Nissan. It's GrenadaNissanUSA.com You're headed up there, what, next week? Uh, yeah, I go up on Sunday. Campbell and I go up on Sunday. She's got orientation on uh, Monday and then I guess Tuesday and then we'll come home after that. So yeah, heading up. First of all, I've really been through the actual campus. Uh, it was pleasant. Had a good time. It was uh, it, it was maybe better than I had in my head. I don't yeah. know why. Just I, I told you I like Fayetteville. I don't like the travel to Fayetteville. Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, it, it's. I mean, I've been going up there for twenty years, and until the last year or so, I'd never really paid attention to it. I go go to the game, leave. Um, I knew how to get to Bud Walton. I knew how to get to the stadium. Um, I never really did Fayetteville at all, but it's a cool town. It reminds me a lot of. It's a bigger Oxford. Sent you a message, by the way. Reply to that when you see it. Yeah, I've got a few left to answer okay. your question. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just we kind of went around. You got a lot of free time when the games are at three and two. Um, that's a little different sometimes. Well, it's not different. It's actually better than usual. But when you play that first one at eleven, you kind of get spoiled, and then you got to kill time the rest of the uh, the rest of the weekend a bit. And there was a Walmart shareholders meeting in town, and that was making the entire place a zoo. Um, wow. every, I bet it was. every time we got into an Uber, they were like, you Walmart people? It's like, no. It's like, oh, who, what, what are you here for? And then you have that whole thing of what do you do and what does that mean? And it's like, just just drive. Just give me the option on the Uber finally to make the guy shut up and not talk to me. Do, I, you, think, not... do you think there's any field that's more completely misunderstood than ours? I don't know if there is on the base level. I mean, there's a lot of fields where I wouldn't understand what people actually do on a day-to-day level. If that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a lot of executives and stuff where I don't know what they actually do. But, yeah, I think it's up. Well, here's what it is. It's people really interested and not understanding. Yeah. Because you're getting questions. And it's there's so many assumptions going on, too. You know, it's more of that kind of thing of, you know, because you go, oh, well, we're sports media or whatever. Because there was... We, we, we took an Uber to dinner, three or four beat riders, uh, a couple nights ago. And you know, the guy's like, oh, well, you know, tell me about this. It's like, oh, crap. Like, I, I swear, I think, I mean, you might have been you and I talking about this. Like, if you go to a bar and you say something else, like, I might just tell people I work for the IRS from now on. Oh, see, I do this all the time. Um, <laughs> my brother, one of my brothers is in insurance. Uh, he's like uh, underwriting and stuff. And I mean, he has multi state territory and all that stuff. And, I was sitting – I'll tell you when it was. I was sitting at a bar in Columbia, South Carolina the night before the Ole Miss game, and I just did not feel like talking to people. I really wanted to be alone. I walked into a bar. The bar – the restaurant had been recommended. It was really good, by the way. And uh, I went – the bar had – it was kind of tilted. There were a lot of people on the left side and really nobody on the right side. And so I went and sat on the far end of the right side. And uh, I was sitting there, and someone came up and started talking. He said, what do you do? And I said, I'm in insurance underwriting. <laughs> and that's it? Yeah. I was like, I work for the Hartford. I'm an auditor. Okay. Peace. And he's like, he's like, oh, okay, well, cool. 
And I know that he was getting a drink, and he left. And I know if I'd said, yeah, I'm a sports writer. I'm here to come to the NCAA tournament. 20 questions. Yeah. I didn't want to answer one question. And so I said, nah, I'm in insurance underwriting. Yeah, every, the- every Uber driver was very inquisitive all weekend. I guess I took six Ubers over the weekend, and every one of them were very inquisitive. Did y'all eat any place good? Uh, no, not really. I went to Doe's because I miss it from when it was here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever night that was, Friday, I guess. But that was it. It was fine. I mean, there was a couple places that I'd go to again, a couple places I wouldn't go to again. I I, I did, you know, I, I got a little spooked. I will tell you this. Um, maybe I shouldn't be telling you this since your daughter's going. Uh, on what night was it? It was Sunday night, I guess. Maybe Saturday night, which one of the two. Um, probably three, four blocks off Dixon. And I was getting a ride with another media member, and he had parked up that way. And we were walking, and like, it was fine. I didn't think whatever. And it was just one person. It wasn't like we were in a bad area. But this guy is across the street, and he's sort of just meandering across the street. But when I looked at him, I could see his eyes were completely glossed over. I could tell he was high as a kite on something. Something was not right. And he kept walking right at us. Like, as we were walking down the path, he sort of changed direction. It wasn't running at us, wasn't whatever, but just coming right at us. And I kind of veered and whatever. And he gets probably 15 feet from me and goes, your shoe is untied. And I thought, I'm not looking down. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. And I said, thanks, bud, and just kind of moved over, and he sort of caught himself. Like, he got within arm's reach of us, just stopped, turned, and walked the other direction. And as we did, one of the guys goes, yeah, your shoe wasn't untied. And I said, yeah, I kind of, I'm a little freaked out right now because I feel like had I looked down, something might have happened. You think he was going to jump you? I don't know. I mean, because he was, look, he, he was hot as a kite. I mean, there was, the, the light bulbs were not on. But that that is that is more startling at times. I don't know. It was fine. Yeah. Got I mean it was cool after that. But it it, it I, I had sort of a weird feeling for a minute. Yeah, I've had stuff like that happen. That is that's creepy when it does, which supports my theory of just avoid people. If you just <laughs> avoid people, these things don't happen. <laughs> had you not gone to dinner, you wouldn't have been in that situation, yeah. and that's just ordered it in. You'd have been all right. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, for anyone that cares, I don't know how you guys are going to watch it or not watch it. The College World Series field, uh, I guess, is set one side of the bracket. Arkansas, Florida State. I was really happy for Mike Martin the other night. That was really neat when his wife came yeah. out on the field and they had their moment. I mean, a, a guy who's never won it, but he also has never had a season with fewer than 40 wins. Consistency. Oh, the epitome. Lots of it. Got it done. Yeah. I guess an LSU team that, frankly, was not very good. They weren't. Relative and, to their normal teams. Yeah. That was a, that that game that won it for uh, um, Florida State was fun to watch. It was, yeah. it was That was as entertaining a college baseball game as I've watched in a long time. The the Fontenot kid just went until he couldn't go anymore. And it was it was fun to watch. I mean, it was, it, it, I'll give them credit, man. That was entertaining. That was so entertaining that Cubs Cardinals was going on at the same time, and I was watching mostly LSU Florida State. Yeah, um, Michigan is in the College World Series. They will play Texas Tech. That is on that same side of the bracket. Frankly, the Pac-12 sucks. Yes. Um, Oregon State lost in their regional. Stanford got hammered by Mississippi State. UCLA gets beat by Michigan. Pac-12, not good. Uh, on the other side of the bracket, it looks like uh, it, it's really a loaded bracket. I kind of feel bad for Auburn because they are there with Louisville and Vanderbilt and Mississippi State. Louisville and Vanderbilt play the uh, the first round. And then uh, the Bulldogs and the Tigers. That 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 Doors Cardinals game has a chance to be kind of appointment television. It really does because Vanderbilt is kind of getting into a habit of struggling with the first game. Now they put their foot down, but yeah, they played I mean, with their food is what they did. But Tracy Rocker's kid is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, he could he could pitch for me all day. An like, attitude I, about him, not a cockiness, just an attitude. If I'm a major league baseball team next year, that's going to be bad. I, that, I might tank for Kumar Rocker. I'm totally serious here. I mean, dude blisters it in the mid to upper nineties, with sustains it. The breaking ball's good. It's a wipeout, and has a personality oh, that dude. I think could really market. Well, I mean, did you see where Duke kept trying to stall him and how pissed he yeah. got on the mound? 
oh yeah and then he yelled at him have yeah. another conference have another conference i'm like oh, that's oh i mean i was like i'm in <laughs> totally in yeah for people that didn't see it duke had a an offensive meeting that they were going to make the umpire break up rocker was throwing a no hitter i think it was the seventh inning and uh it was clear what they were doing, and Rocker did not handle it well. He strikes out the guy on three or four pitches and then completely yells in that direction. Didn't that kid – and correct me if I'm wrong, because I've been doing this with my mind all weekend. There's – Tracy Rocker was at Ole Miss for a year with Houston with Houston Nutt, yeah. coaching defensive line, and, and that was when – that year defensive line was a big storyline because of Perry Jerry and Greg Hardy and, and, and whatnot. Didn't Kumar used to come to a lot of the practices? Yeah, the Kumar end? spent a year or two in Oxford Elementary. And I, and I, I think I remember him at the practices because he was such a big kid. Yeah. He's still a big kid. Anyway, I, I always liked Tracy Rocker. I know a lot of people that covered him sometimes thought he was um, – abrasive or whatnot that one year that i covered him i really enjoyed it uh, i loved watching him work he was a technician with defensive linemen and and mm-hmm. uh so I, I don't know the kid the kid's fantastic and and uh that was fun you, you know i still think i'm right i think it's vanderbilt and arkansas in the final i don't hate that uh vanderbilt though is susceptible in that game one fellows is not their typical ace rocker no. is their best picture pitcher Hickman yeah. is very good, but Fellows and Raby can have some days where they're sort of off. If you told me that Isaiah Campbell won game one against Vanderbilt and then Arkansas didn't have enough to win one more, I'd buy it. Yeah. Because I think Vanderbilt would slap Nolan and Wicklander around. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It'd now, be... Omaha changes everything offensively, though, because it's just so hard to hit the dang ball out of there. Yeah. And Arkansas kind of has that lineup that makes a lot of contact. Yeah, and it's not it's not even home runs. I mean, it is, but everybody talks about extra base hits. It's because it's so hard to hit the ball over the outfield's head that the outfielders play so shallow that you can't hit singles in. That short line drive gets called all of a sudden. So the only way to get base hits is to roll the ball through the infield. To me, that was the biggest difference in Omaha versus other parks from an offensive standpoint. But either way, whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm... I'm all in, you know. I, I hope I, I, w- I hope Tanner Burns is healthy because I would be really interested in a Tanner Burns Ethan Small first round game. Yeah, I don't think he's healthy. I think I he either. might pitch. He might pitch two innings, but I don't think he's healthy. And yeah, Arkin. I mean, Auburn scored 13 in the first yesterday, so that made things a lot easier on Butch. Yeah, yeah. Well, 13 to nothing after half inning is. That's probably for a coach. That's probably about it. You know, Ole Miss did not have a good final day, but it was not worse than losing a game three after giving up thirteen in the first, where it's completely over before you even hit. And what Duke had to deal with, where they were getting beat fourteen to two or whatever, and had to deal with a three-hour lightning delay. Oh yeah, that's where you want to go. Come on, fellas, can we go home? Yeah, you almost want to go across the Corbin and go look. Here's the white towel. I mean, I, I get it. Yeah, I mean. Don't, don't we have a travel rule or something here? I mean, let, let's go. Um, you probably didn't see it because you were driving. As dramatic an NBA Finals game as I can I ever. I listened go. on the drive. I, I heard the call. I was listening live. Uh, just absolutely dramatic. The game reminded me. I mean, I was having PTSD last night. That game reminded me so much of game six of the Western Conference Finals in 2016 that frankly i had to sometimes kind of get away from it i was like i've watched this before and when it ended carson was so upset at it i think he had true ptsd i still haven't talked to him since it ended last night he just went upstairs (laughs) he i've decided that he hates the warriors in the way that i hate the cardinals and when something happens you just sort of have to let people have their moment and um he went upstairs, and I have not heard from him since. I think, I think the the Clay Thompson Steph Curry shots late to tie the game traumatized him. They had a six point lead with just under two to go. Yeah, and uh, Clay makes a shot, and uh, Steph makes a shot. Steph makes a shot, and then you know they're at the end. They uh, get the turnover, and eh. but the the biggest story from that game, of course, and you can see the replay. Uh, it is Kevin, a ruptured Achilles. 
It is absolutely a ruptured Achilles. When they slow it down on the replay, you can see the muscle ripple up his calf. Yeah, they say you see it. It looks like a gunshot or like a wave goes off in his leg. Yeah. Um, Kevin Durant's thirty. He uh, he had a. It's very clear now that obviously he he wasn't playing on a torn Achilles. He was playing with a calf injury that that jeopardized his right leg. I don't have a hot take here. I, 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 other than to say this, it is for the the gazillionth time, and I'm I'm biased on this, and I admit it. I, I mean, I, I cheer for the Thunder. That's who I follow. And Kevin Durant was the greatest player in Thunder history, obviously. Period. The end. And I wanted him to stay in Oklahoma City for a lot of reasons, and he didn't. And um. Obviously, for Carson, it was devastating, which made it devastating for, for me to some degree. And I hated it because it was the end of a competitive window. And I think had he stayed, it would have been better for the NBA. And I love the NBA, blah, blah, blah. It is the gazillionth time that I question who are the people around Kevin Durant who help him make decisions? And how do they get so many decisions wrong? Well, look. There's not a long list of Achilles injuries that have turned into productive all-star type careers following them. It's a list of one it's name. It's Dominique Wilkins. He's it. And, and Durant is a Wilkins type freak, but still. <laughs> he he is, but he's 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 a different kind of player than Dominique Wilkins. I mean, you know, Dominique Wilkins was was freakishly athletic. Yeah. And uh, you know, could just destroy the rim and all of those things. Durant's the basketball more, equivalent of like when Adrian Peterson comes back from an ACL tear in like four months. It's like, okay, well, you're just different. Yeah. And, and, and I hope Kevin Durant's that guy. But there's a long list of, of basketball players who tear an Achilles and are never anywhere close to the same. And here's what's fascinating. And it's sad and all of those things. But Kevin Durant's a free agent. And the NBA, so many teams, the Knicks, the Nets, the Clippers have been sort of setting up their offseason to prepare for a run at Kevin Durant. And now, realistically, he's not playing next season. And if you give him a max deal, you know you're paying him one year the max to not play. And then are you getting a max level player? He'll be in his 30s. Kevin Durant's been in the league a long time. I would want nothing to do with it. I'd have to leave it alone. And so it uh it's fascinating really. It it's this series is now they're going to go back to Oakland. I think that was the most three-pointers in a playoff game that the Warriors have made since the aforementioned game 6 against Oklahoma City that completely changed the NBA. I I think the Raptors are going to get this done. They get two more shots at it. I think they're going to get it done. They shot as badly as they could last night. Golden State shot as well as they could, and it was still a one-point game. So I, I think, I think it gets done. But it, a traumatic offseason just got, in some ways, one of the big storylines got taken away, and in some ways now it makes it even more dramatic kind of wonder what Kevin at some point I wish Kevin Durant would tell his people here's what I want to do and maybe he did but he had not played in a month and now you're, you're starting to hear that not only had he not played in a month chase on the, in the comeback in this attempt to get back on the floor to silence all the critics who were questioning his desire and all of those things he played some two on two he played some three-on-three three against staffers and stuff. I mean, like assistant coaches and stuff. He didn't have any full scrimmage. And then you get out there in the first half of an NBA Finals Game 5 against athletes like Kawhi Leonard and, and um, Serge Ibaka and, and, and people like that, and your, your adrenaline's pumping at that level it can't be surprising to anybody what happened. No doubt. I mean, I 
hopefully the Raptors do finish it just to give some 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 semblance of something different in the NBA. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it game six, I, it, my money, I don't know. I, I, I think the Warriors win game six and we get a game seven. And if we get a game seven, hell, anybody, anybody that wants to count out Clay Thompson and Steph Curry in a big game, go for it. I've seen, I've, I've seen the horror too many times to, to not touch on it. People are going to get mad at us, Chase, if we don't touch on football recruiting. Yeah, I'll do that in one second. First, I'll tell you about uh, GNM Pharmacy there on South Lamar in Oxford. You can uh, transfer your medications. You can join a pharmacy that cares about you, knows you, and will take care of you. 662 236 2222. You know, they deliver local in the Oxford area to your home or workplace. They offer MedSync to make sure you are uh, taking the medicines on schedule as you need them and much more. And you get the CBD oil I've been telling you about. They got it in multiple different forms. Uh, for that. So you can find out more, move medications, and whatever you need. 662-236-2222. Puck is also brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry is an Oxford-based Remax legacy, legacy Realty agent. He's a big part of Savannah Square. It's a new nine-acre development, seven-tenths of a mile from the Oxford downtown square. It's conveniently located east of North Lamar, just a short stroll from the Midtown Shopping Center. Uh, Savannah Square will initially consist of 32 standalone detached structures ranging in size from about 1,100 square feet to 2,400 square feet. The model home is available for your inspection at 215 William Street. Uh, these homes have wonderful layouts, impeccable finishes, which you can inspect at the model. So get in touch with Harry. Go to savannasquareoxford.com or uh, send Harry a text or give him a call at 662-801-5621 podcast also brought to you by Oxford University Bank, OUB, locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB gives you the comfort of home, all the benefits the big mega banks provide, all the technology and products you can want, all with a personal touch. Um, when you uh, go to OUB, that you also have Casasa. It's the uh, absolute best cash checking account. Pays pays customers 2.5% interest on their balances up to $50,000. And they also have a a commercial checking account now paying 1% interest as long as you keep $10,000 in the account. And it comes with fully interactive online banking. To learn more about OUB, check out liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234-6668. OUB is FDIC insured. We're also brought to you by Scoopers Pet Waste Removal. Everyone loves their pets. No one loves stepping in their pet stuff. And tracking that stuff into your house can be a nightmare, obviously. So scoopers will take care of it. They'll go into your backyard, your apartment complex, your condominium. They'll pick up what no one really wants to pick up. For $10 of cleaning, scoopers will clean up your yard. They'll do it on your schedule, whether that's weekly, biweekly, or a one-time service. No contracts are required. You can cancel at any time. And if you have multiple dogs, it's okay. It's just $2 for each additional dog. So if you own a home, a condo, or an apartment complex in Oxford and you'd like to deal with a lot less crap, call Scoopers, 662-506-2754, or simply send them an email at scoopers.oxfordpetwaste at gmail.com to get your cleaning scheduled today. Scoopers Pet Waste Removal, number one in your pet's number two business. And we're going to have to talk some football, and before we do, we'll tell you that if you're coming up uh, this fall for uh, – football games, whether it's one game, whether it's all seven games, or some number in between one and seven, and you're tailgating, you want to get in touch with Kyle and Jordan Thornton in Seven South Tailgating. Kyle is a former Ole Miss baseball player. Jordan, a former Ole Miss football staff member. What started as a way to pay for college has become the greatest tailgating service provider at Ole Miss. The uh, team at Seven South are rebels through and through and take pride in the Grove and the impact their service has on protecting, preserving, and enriching the Ole Miss game day tailgating tradition. So call them at 662-321-1682 or visit 7southtailgating.com. So uh, you mentioned football recruiting. I see there has been a uh, several commits, been a little bit of a, uh, a run on commitments this weekend, maybe more to go. I'll let you ed- ed- educate me. Yeah, I can't even keep up with it. Uh, there are tons of them. Lots of guys have committed. They Stories uh, on rebelgrove.com. Yeah, I've written stories on on every one. I'll be honest, I'm on uh, commit watch on three guys right now. Um, I don't know when those are coming. I thought a couple of them were coming last night, and they didn't. Uh, I think one's coming this morning, but I'm not positive. I don't know. I've learned with the kids. I've been out of this for a little while. 
getting your video or graphic prepared is the last step. And until that is prepared and prepared to your satisfaction, it is uh, your your commitment stays very private. They have some commitments that have not gone public because they're waiting on the video or the graphic to get done. But the question that everyone's asking is this, and I'm going to write about this in 10 Thoughts. So I'm just going to summarize it here. They're taking a lot of, quote, unranked or lowly ranked guys. That's what people are saying. And I get where that is a concern. I understand it. But they're getting guys that have been that, that came to camp. They had, I don't know, 10 days of camp. I was out there a lot over the last two weeks. And um, they're taking guys that they evaluated in camp. So they got them at camp. The way this works is you come, and after you're, you pre-registered, you're signed up. They know you're coming. And they get you stretched, and they put you through some kind of warm-up drills to get you good and loose. And then they take you, and they run. you run the 40. They have nine watches on you. And so it's a hand time, but you have nine hands. And they take away the low time, and they take away the high time, and then they average the other seven times to get a fairly reliable 40 time. Then they put you in a shuttle drill, same thing. Then they, it's that 10-5-10 shuttle, the 5-10-5 shuttle. And then they put you uh, on the on the vertical thing. And if you jump more than 30 inches, they take you to the one that's the more very specific vertical, and they get your vertical. And then they put you in football drills that are videoed so they can go back later and look at the video of the drills and make sure that, hey, did we see what we think we saw? And they cross-check. So, yeah, are they offering some guys that people had not really heard of? Yes. But they're watching them. And so I talked about this the other day. And, and look, it's either going to work or it's not. But it's going to be one of those things where it's going to be obvious that it's working or not because they're in the scoreboard business. And if they don't win enough games, they don't score enough points, they don't stop the other team from scoring enough points, they're all going to get fired. And they know that. It's not, it's not a, that is not your hot take of the day. You, you're in the scoreboard business in coaching. And if you don't win, they fire you and look for somebody who will come in and win. They are very clearly following a plan. I think it's commendable, whether it works or not, that you're not – allowing yourself to become hostage to public opinion and you're not doing what the previous staff did which was chase stars and this is mississippi and the kid from uh kentrell bullock from um from columbia mississippi he hasn't been to the camps and so rivals doesn't really have a rating on him because they haven't really seen him and this isn't me knocking rivals either but the state of Mississippi, we don't have a Mississippi State site. We don't have one. I mean, we do have one, but it's tree falling in the forest and all that. Um, and then, frankly, with our Ole Miss site, this last year, the, the guy covering recruiting is living in Ohio. And the regional guy over Mississippi is in Georgia. And he covers Georgia, and he covers Alabama, and he covers Old Mi- and, uh, Mississippi, and he might cover something else. And Chad does a really good job, but Chad is one person. And it's my understanding that he has 24 hours in his day and just seven days in his week. And so there, there, it, it is a finite number. You you can't do it and not let anything slip through the cracks. Yeah. And so there. They have on the offensive line, they want tall kids. They got Khalil Benson yesterday from South Haven. He's 6'6". There's another offensive lineman who I think they're about to commit soon who is also about 6'6". They they want tall offensive linemen, and they want guys who can play tackle. And then if you can play tackle, you can play guard. And if you can play guard, you can play center. They don't want these shorter, bigger, burly guys who, when they don't work out, their roster kill they they have a plan and the plan will either work or not but i will say this the people that are that are just so worked up over why are you why are quote why are we not getting the four and five star players it's two things 
one, this is a staff that is doing kind of their own evaluations. They're not reliant on t- rivals on 24-7, on ESPN to rank players for them. They're doing it themselves. And then two, and this is the part that I think is hard for fans, the elite five-star player who everyone in the country knows is a five-star player, that we're, nobody's arguing it. Getting that player to come to Ole Miss right now is very difficult. That kid has offers at Alabama, at Georgia, at wherever. Getting that kid to come to Ole Miss right now is difficult. It's not realistic. This is a program that does have to rebuild. It has to rebuild its image. It has to rebuild its brand. Um, there's a lot that has to happen before they get back to that place. And they're not there yet. Pretty good uh, summation there. I've uh, been completely out of pocket, so I don't have much to add, but I think I agree with everything you said. So, but, uh, don't know. I'll take your word for it. Uh, camp season, how much is left, you say? It's over. No, so, it's not. okay. There's two weeks. This week and next week, there will be some kids that, that, that come back for visits to like you know check out the campus and talk to coaches and bring family or whatnot. And then the dead period starts after that. And uh, I think this was the last big recruiting event of, of the year. They, uh, they very clearly utilized their, uh, their camp window. They got a lot done in that camp. I know that people inside the program feel a lot better about where they are than where they were two weeks ago. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll talk more football recruiting as the uh, the Daves move on. We're in the summer now. The uh, the athletic year is over, so we'll uh, we'll get creative as always. We'll bring you podcasts. We'll take some time off too. We'll do a lot of stuff with you as we uh, finish up uh, the baseball conversations and football. will be here before we know it. You know, I mean, obviously, media days is the beginning of football season, even though there's eight weeks after that before the season actually begins. So it. Uh, it is what it is. But anyway, a lot of baseball talk today. Appreciate all you guys hanging in with us, and we will uh, be back tomorrow to talk to you then.